Okay, so make sure I kind of feel that. like that woman's voice and the Siri lady probably like talk to each other on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> this one, the recording and it's so jarring every yeah. time I hear it. Everybody, I'm Mandy Ray with Ecstatic Astrology, and this is. Do you like to say Practical Astros or Krista? Do you like both? I like both. I, I my my current little thing is I'm Krista, but the internet knows me as Practical Astros, so that's my that's my spiel. So the way. internet knows her as Practical Astros. <laughs> I like Krista too. I like both of them. Yeah, uh, and we're gonna go over April. <sighs> dum dum dum. <laughs> Uh, we spent just like a little time before we hit record, um, talking about it. So I'm excited and nervous all at the same time, because it, that's how this month feels yeah. to me. I'm going to share the calendar. Let's <laughs> see. Here we go. And we start with Mercury retrograde. I like the Uno reverse card. <laughs> so my son who's 10, um, when we were on vacation somewhere, he kept one of those in his pocket. And when he didn't like something, he would just like flash it up. Like in reverse that situation, <laughs> like he was using it as like a, like a, like a real life, tangible analog meme of like, no, nope, I don't like this. You know, reverse it. <laughs> yeah. It's such a harbinger too, for the rest yeah. of April. And it's funny because Uno reverse is kind of like the, the full card in tarot too. It's just like, mm-hmm. mm, I think I'll go the other way. Yep. Uh, and it's April Fool's Day. Yeah. I didn't put that on there. I didn't, I, like some of the things that you put on the calendar, like you were talking about, you didn't even write eclipse on mm-hmm. your April calendar. And it's like, I'm not even, I'm not even going to put April Fool's Day on there. <laughs> yeah. There's so much. That's the thing about like, well, we were talking earlier, like I, I'm already exhausted. I'm already tired of April. And that's part of it is because there's just so much. I mean, there's not really much of a break through the whole month. And so, um, you know, my joke is like, just take it one day at a time, like literally just, just one day at a time, one, and you'll deal with the repercussions or like sort it out later. Um, but it it can be just too much to be like, it's this and this and this and this and this, and then all those things are going to, um, be activated again in a couple more days by a different transit, you know? So absolutely. And yeah, we can talk about too, the fact that the, the lay of the land, as we move into April, Mars is in Pisces. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the ruler of Aries where Mercury is going to retrograde in a sign that doesn't really take action. If it takes action, it's on floating away, you know, it's like, (laughs) that's what it wants to do. Yeah. So taking it slow is probably going to be important Mm -hmm. because I don't know that there's a whole lot we can, and, you know, maybe focusing on imagination and how can I look at this differently? And when you retrace your steps, you do go slowly anyway to, if you're, especially if you're trying to find something, you know? Yeah. 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 Maybe it's a good thing that Mars is in Pisces. It can't see Aries. It can't see all those things in it. And in Hellenistic astrology, we like lines of sight because then they kind of get empowered, but maybe that's like kind of a, um, like a silver lining to kind of like a fire cloud is that Mars can't really direct all the airy stuff. Um, yeah. and, and just having that, the, the blend of Mars and Pisces feels antithetical to each other just because Pisces does not like to kind of pinpoint and make the, like the symbol of Mars is that circle with that arrow pointing out, like that's definitely the way I want to go. And Pisces doesn't have that at all. It's like a squiggly, it's like a bunch of squiggly arrows that change their mind as they float around in the water. So they just, it's a, it's a funny, um, uh, combination cause they feel like foils to each other and that planet and that sign just feel like foils to each other. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I mean, you can almost feel like Mercury is still in Pisces, I think, during this Mercury retrograde mm-hmm. for a little while with Mars in Pisces. It's just kind of like, I still don't know. And that's why I have to turn around for a minute and look back at whatever I've been doing and rethink it. 
maybe imagine it a little more, think outside of the box because mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, Pisces being confusion and uh, delusion really can have you turned around, you know? So yeah. Yeah. I mean, the mercury goes, what it turns around at 27 degrees or something like that. So it's already gone through air, like the majority of Aries, it kind of bulldozed through Aries and you know, it's going to spend a ton of time in Aries. I think it goes into Taurus like mid May. So Mm -hmm. all of the month of April, we have that, that mercury in Aries, whether it's retrograde or shadow and, um, going back to, I think it's stations at 15, which is right around the, I think we talked about this last month. Mm -hmm. It's like, it goes all the way back to the North node as if it has to kind of get a secret from the North node a little bit later. It's like, it has to turn around to kind of clarify what exactly did you say during that eclipse on the eighth where Chiron and the moon and the sun were all exactly piled up on top of each other. It feels like Mercury goes back to get that whatever secret was kind of revealed. Yeah. I'm jumping way ahead, but no, I like it. I think that makes me want to look, um, whoops, I need to do the Mercury retrograde. So here we go. It turns retrograde at 27, mm-hmm. 13. And then, yeah, it goes all the way back to the North node here at 15. Yeah. I think it's funny. It's just got a few minutes in between it. It, it doesn't quite touch it. It's just like, I see you. I mm-hmm. see you, you know, it's like, like those eyes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we can look at the last time Mercury conjoined um, the North node Oh, that, that was August 22. Um, well, yeah, it's that's, not letting me. That's not Mars. It. It's trans. Oh, you're Mars. right. Thank you. I already feel like it's Mercury retrograde. <laughs> really, really. I mean, it's been that way for me already. Mm-hmm. So here we go. March 18th uh, was the first time. So mm-hmm. it's going to do it three times. And I love that with a Mercury retrograde, the mm-hmm. the three times, if you have anything around that degree as well, or in between, it'll hit your personal point, whatever that is three times. And I think that's significant. You know, I don't know why that three time retrograde with any planet really yeah. seems like a moment that it's just like, okay, the first time I thought this, then I go back and I go, I don't know. And then it's like the resolution the third time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's really two with the North node, but it stays there for a minute, you know, just kind of like yeah. stations on it, which is like, you know, a moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you look back to March 18th, you can think about the next time it sits at the North node, which is April 25th. So, mm. and this was the day after, was it sun Neptune conjunction? Yeah. Yes. St. Patrick's day was that sun Neptune tune conjunction but one one thing just about the retrograde movement like it it's uh it's not like a clean looking stitch but that's kind of <clears throat> the the shape that it makes it looks like it goes back and it creates a stitch mm-hmm. you know through a stitch through time you know to kind of like anchor us a little bit more and i i like thinking of mercury being that one that that goes and makes us very very small but very securing um kind of clarifications of information um, absolutely in a, in a stitch pattern you know it it's does also his exaltation degree which always cracks me up whenever they they like put their foot on a stone of like that's mine that's where i'm going to turn around um mercury ha- loves that that very middle point because he likes to go between worlds so it's an easy one to remember it's like mercury likes 15 that's like the very middle of the sign ah that's so cool that's really cool and the stitch, I was looking for my graphic. I have one that, and it really does. I actually mm-hmm. never picked up on the stitch part for some reason, but you yeah. really brought that out for me. So I love it. Uh, and yeah, so that's the whole month of Mercury retrograde. You can just kind of, that's going to color all of April. And that's why we, when we first went into this, started with it. So yeah. Uh, the next big thing is Venus moving into Aries. And I have a heart warrior on my calendar because <laughs> Venus gets what, Venus wants but is that like the best thing for Venus you know Mm -hmm. that's why it's it's it doesn't operate as well in Aries but does it (laughs) yeah I mean if you think Venus exalts in the sign prior so imagine like you were the guest of honor and everybody brought everything you wanted or didn't even realize you wanted and you kind of left kind of really high on your horse because you got everything 
and she then she like gets doused in fire in Aries. I like Venus and Aries. I like the fire. I like the 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 I like that she's not at home and that she kind of just is freed from the shackles of what's expected of her, like in Libra. But in thinking about this, I was talking about this yesterday with some uh, other astro friends and and what really came to me is the empowerment of the feminine of the yin. And maybe we're going to really need to call on that. And that's why she's here this month in Aries of really activating the, that inner yin fire, which looks different than yang fire. Um, but maybe we're going to have to pull on that. So maybe the, just the themes of, of, you know, I mean, women, like as a mom, as you're a mom, we don't need anybody to tell us that we're awesome. Cause we know it. We know how much we do. We know how much <laughs> we're capable of. We have a million plates spinning in our mind currently. Mm-hmm. And so we don't need like platitudes of that. We need support and we need empowerment in the way where uh, someone asked me yesterday, what's my love language? And I was like, I just want people to take care of themselves and their own problems. I want people mm. to be responsible for themselves. And if everybody does that, that supports everybody and it supports the caretakers, which predominantly have been women. So that's kind of what's been of, of top of mind for me with Venus and Aries is the empowerment of women, but through the empowerment of everybody just taking care of themselves so mm. that it doesn't um, put unnecessary burden on the caretakers, which are the, are the, are the yin people, the one, the ones that receive and hold and carry for others, which traditionally have been women. But I'm just hoping that we have kind of that general empowerment across the board where we just take care of our responsibilities in that yin way, you know, like mm. the, you use this moment as a way to just take responsibility and activate and access that kind of power. Cause I love, I love that fiery Venus, you know, I, I just, um, I, I do too. too long, but I do love it when yeah. she shows up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not exactly good for peace. I mean, that's yeah. not what Venus and, and Aries is about, but yeah. I do like, I got the same image and I especially kind of started to get that coming to me as Venus moved into Taurus too. It's like mm. that, I, I'm coming home and I'm going to get home, you know, mm. that sort of movement through Aries. Yeah. And I have, even when Venus does move into Taurus, the, the queen knock on uh, the 29th, the queen <laughs> knocking the pot off because That's it's like, great. I'm, I'm home, you know, get and out of my way. considering there are so many, um, especially in the outside world, things going on with women's rights, um, you have, you have that, I think, mixed in with all of this as well. I mean, right now there's a, a case at the Supreme Court, you know, so even in the outer world, it's reflective. I mean, it always is, but yeah. <laughs> I find it always is. But most What's that saying as above, so below? <laughs> exactly. What is that again? <laughs> what is that? How does that rhyme? Oh, uh, yeah. And, you know, interestingly, Venus being in Aries and looking at Mars in her exalted place too is interesting Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost as if they, because they do start to when they both come home at the end of the month and they do um, Mars moving into Aries and Venus being in Taurus. It's almost as if even though they don't, you, they don't work together when they're both at home, it does work so well. Yeah. I feel like and they they may be exchanging messages at this point. I think Venus just Mm -hmm. moved through Pisces. Mars is, moving through Pisces now. And it's given me a little bit of a Joan of Arc kind of feel, Mm -hmm. you know, even though they're not technically cooperating and, and even Jupiter being in Venus's sign, it's like all three are answering to each other in this very interesting way. Yeah. So, you know, that Joan of Arc quality comes out a little bit as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I like the idea of she's almost home. Like she's got to like fight her way. It's like, she can see the, see the light at the end of the tum- tunnel or like the darkest hours just before the dawn. Like she's really, she really does have to fight and be, um, you know, defend herself. You know I mean? She does rule the last decan of Aries. So she does have like some sort of familiarity. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I'd like to think about it is, you know, uh, say you're on vacation or you're just traveling and you're not at home 
And so you, all you have is just the bag on your back and you're free to kind of move around and do what you want. And Mm -hmm. it might be more challenging to figure out where you're going to sleep or are you allergic to the food or are you the strangers you meet on the road? Are they friendly? Are they not? There's that adventurous spirit of it, but it's also like, you don't have to pull the trash out to the road. You don't have to worry about, you know, going to work. You don't have to, you know, go grocery shopping or fix the hole in the roof or whatever you, you you're freed from the, um, the responsibilities that, that come with being at home. And you're also liberated from the comfort. So you have to kind of seek out. And so it, it can be exhausting and really fun at the same time. And so when any planet's not at home, I like to think of it that way, it makes you really resourceful. If you ever traveled, you get resourceful quick. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. That you know, is so true. And I think that's easy. why I love it so much. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. It's fulfilling. Yeah. And I do think that that's part of Venus and Aries, especially looking forward to the next, the black hole I have on here, basically <laughs> uh, April 8th. I mean, Venus has to contend with that in the same sign, you know? Yeah. And so it it is, and I'm, I'm actually driving to the eclipse path. Uh, yeah, right. it, yeah, to Arkansas from mm-hmm. Birmingham, Alabama, where I am. Uh, and I, I've seen all of these warnings and conspiracy theories. And <laughs> increasingly, I'm like, do I take this adventure? And <laughs> and I'm like, yes, of course I do. If something happens, I'll it'll be the best story of my entire life. You yeah, know? yeah. You're like a field reporter for the Astrology <laughs> Network. <laughs> I'm here with the Bayful Rays. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, th- th- there's much to be said. We should show the chart. We talked about it a little at the last video, like you said, but I do feel like we were still so far away. And now that we've had the Libra eclipse, the lunar eclipse, it's a little more touchable, you know, so mm-hmm. we can kind of, let's see, let's see this time. I'm not going to look at 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have been since Mercury went into its shadow, tripping over my words and already, <laughs> and I, and I have Mercury and Sagittarius. So I think that trine probably doesn't help, you know, like, yeah. And Jupiter and, and there's this like extra kind of blah, 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 happening mm-hmm. to me. Yep. So funny to see, hate it. That's okay. Well, yesterday I was trying to say Neptune conjunct Venus and I was like, Nep croon. <sighs> it's like it wouldn't come out it's like nepcoon nepcoon it's just like i know what i'm trying to say it just would not exit in the proper order and i was like Ugh. oh yeah. it's just going to uh I, I look forward to the funny you know like whatever yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be funny yeah hopefully if I, I will keep that um through april 8th at 19 degrees with chiron chiron the minute that really does Two the <laughs> and let's let's just uh i'm going to circle this whole thing because mm-hmm. it all makes sense to talk about so what uh what do you have to say about chiron being with it well he's definitely getting everyone's attention uh i think we talked last time of you know there are some astrologers and i've definitely been in that camp of like i don't really pay attention to chiron i mm-hmm. as i've studied more i pay more and more attention to him He's kind of an elusive teacher. And I think that's part of why there's like this um, either or there's some people what the very first astrology reading I gave as a professional astrologer, I gave to a friend and she thanked me at the end of the reading. And she was like, thanks for not just talking about my Chiron. And I was like, what do you mean? She said the last reading I had, the woman was just obsessed with my Chiron placement. And that's really all she talked about. And I was like, well, you came to the right one. Cause I don't really pay attention to Chiron. Oh, yeah. But then I, I took that of like my approach and her, that other astrologer's approach is neither perfect because yeah. you, you, you really just need to talk to the client and whatever is sparkly and shiny of the reading. It's kind of like, that's what I need. Even if I don't exactly know what I'm going to say and I'm drawn to it. And so Chiron here is that reminder of when everything, anything happens at that exact minute, It's to get our attention of like, Hey, Mm. pay attention to me. And the fact that the eclipse is happening with Chiron to that very minute, it feels like, okay, you've got my attention. What does it mean? 
Now, my delineation of that, I don't know. I think that as we are all experiencing it together, maybe it is some sort of collective understanding of, um, uh, 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 again, the empowerment word keeps coming up because it's Aries of like, it's at the exaltation degree of Aries at 19. So it's like the sun is exalted um, in, its, in its sign at the degree. Usually when the sun is there in the eclipse, it has something to do with leaders, like the, the, mm. the planet that sees us all. And so maybe it's some sort of healing related to the leaders that we choose and thinking about the leaders that we choose. Is this the death of a leader? Maybe. Is this just a collective healing around our choices of empowerment? Those are kind of like my Mad Lib <laughs> answer for yeah. this eclipse. Um, but I know that you work with Chiron a lot more than I do. So I'm curious to hear what, what you think. I think the only, the, the biggest time I work with Chiron is when I find that it's returning. So people mm -hmm. at 50 is probably when I do focus mm -hmm. on it most, Yeah, like you said, because when it returns, it seems significant, like a significant moment, but I don't necessarily, I like the placement to understand a little bit of, of what we might hold as a wound. And mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly helpful for taking and for empowerment for taking your power back there. And it does seem to me like there is a little bit of that in this, but the, the healing portion of it comes through a lot more, I think, than, mm -hmm. than anything. And I was reading the Sabian symbol for it and it's um, overcoming crisis through compassion is pretty much the idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a young girl feeding birds in the winter is the, oh, the I love Sabian that. That's symbol. Sweet. It is sweet. And, you know, with Venus co-present, mm -hmm. you know, bringing that compassion to maybe a place where we don't, where there's more fire, generally speaking, Venus always does bring kind of a, a nice, uh, cool touch to mm -hmm. an area, you know? So that with Chiron, I think there is that there, but usually when Chiron's involved, there's a pinprick first, you know, there's a, a wincing moment. Like if you have to heal a cut, well, you have to clean it. And that doesn't necessarily always feel great. So I do think of that there, like what is the thing that's going to maybe not feel great that causes us to, to understand that we have to have compassion and Aries for ourselves, for our identities, for who we are, for what we desire, for what mm -hmm. we want, you know, and then, um, the Mars Saturn conjunction yeah. being <laughs> <laughs> applying. <laughs> I mean, and it's interesting because it, it does seem to be a wake up call from delusion, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if Chiron's even looking, where's Mars? Where's the ruler of this place that I'm at, you know, and mm -hmm. there's a solar eclipse here and it's looking at Mars and Mars is meeting Saturn in this sign of, delusion. And I think of all of the misinformation and crazy amount of what is a fact now? Yeah. I don't know what a fact is, you yeah. know, um, that, that may be just a moment where everyone kind of goes, whoa, the world is different mm -hmm. and we have to approach it in a way that makes sense now. Yeah. Um, coupled with the fact that even Mars, Saturn and Neptune are looking at Jupiter and Jupiter and Uranus are, mm -hmm meeting up and there's yep. change there's change in the most fundamental i mean it, fixed earth is the the most fixed you can get you know yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Like, i was thinking about the word to realize feels like a torian word it's like mm -hmm. to make real to to put into to form that we can experience mm -hmm. and and we'll talk about the the um jupiter uranus conjunction but it's already pretty close um, and, and to, to have that conjunction in that fixed earth sign, it, it does feel like it will be a tangible, real fundamental cracking open shift. Um, even if it's just a person being born that day that yeah. fundamentally changes us that we won't see, but will be, um, like a, a, a very pivotal character in all of human history or in, in enough human history to make a tangible, visible difference. But yeah, Mars approaching Saturn at that moment, um, Venus is just at 
the uh, under the beams like by two minutes so i kind of feel like she's just her the tips of her toes are starting to be a little singed but she's still you know far enough away where she's able to witness that um you know just being so fiery and all that stuff and and fire um it's on on the moon's day um, in the middle of the day, I mean, I, I'm expecting it to just be a clear news story, you know, not, I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to wager good or bad because, you know, I'm not, it, it feels it's impossible weird. for this moment. It is. And it also feels gross, honestly, <laughs> it to, does. Be like, to, to be a, a, um, a harbinger of doom because it could be something amazing, but usually eclipses get your attention and a solar eclipse at the exaltation degree mm-hmm. and sign. It's kind of like, with Chiron, it's like, it, it's going to be loud. Um, and one thing Nick Dagan best astrologer talks about this month being kind of the beginning of the century, like yeah. the astrology of this month really being pivotal and change. Um, and it feels like it really does start with the eclipse, but most potently at that Jupiter Uranus conjunction of like, these are one thing there is no no, re- no regrets, coyote, no return going forward from this moment on. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does feel like that the first doorway of no re-entry is, is the, this eclipse moment. Yeah. And I, you know, I had a dream about a key opening the mm-hmm. moon during the lunar eclipse and uh, someone brought up that Chiron looks like a key. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, what is unlocking? And and the generation that's turning 50 with their Chiron return mm-hmm. has this happening on their Chiron. And and are, you know, are there any 50-year-olds in high political office? Maybe one or two, you know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and this kind of maybe coming forth of of that generation a little bit, like, oh gosh, we have to wake up and do something, you know. Mm-hmm. It is it does feel like, yeah, the beginning of a century, a wake up call. And then the Mercury retrograde on top of all of it, it just feels like Mercury is icing the cake a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I, I it's a red it, velvet cake. <laughs> I called it the, uh, r- the Mercury retrograde is the kindling of the dumpster fire that is Aries. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> or that is April. Sorry. Yeah. It's like, he is just ever present and he's just like keeping it all, just, uh, keeping that fire going. Yeah, this is the looky loo. This is also like the, you know, you see a, a wreck and you have to look at it. And then this Mercury gets out and goes over to it. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta see this, you know. Yeah. It's it's funny. And and we will be, I think, witnessing. And like you said, who knows? I could throw out so many different possible I know that what's going on in the news right now, and it it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. Take it a day at a time. <laughs> yeah. One day at a time. One All right. in front of the other. Do you have anything more to say about this or should we go back to the calendar? Uh, let's go back to the calendar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Feeling it. Uh, yeah. The next thing is when Mars hits Saturn and I have, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of like this caution sign, even in the ninth, you know, we're, we're not, mm. it, it's building at the eighth and, you know, I like it. I think what Chris Brennan, they, they call it the gas and the brakes at mm-hmm. the same time. Um, and it does feel like pressure uh, and action. So that's why I put the deadline thing uh, mm-hmm. there because it feels like I- I've got to get something done. But at the same time, I can't, you know, if you would just leave me alone, I'd get it done kind of a yeah. thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but in, in Pisces, Pisces, which doesn't feel like a deadline <laughs> loving sign. I mean, that might be disparaging Pisces, but it does feel like the hard edge feels like it's being met here in Pisces, which maybe isn't um, familiar or desiring of that hard edge, you know? Right. Um, That's why Mars and Saturn like Capricorn because Capricorn is the goat that lives on the edge, likes those edges, but Pisces, maybe not so much. So I can, I can see that this would be uncomfortable, but maybe it's just that container for the compassion that you talked about earlier and the Mm. the Mars there having the, the, the passion and the, the, um, you know, willingness to fight for, uh, compassionate reasons. Maybe, maybe that's, what's going to be called. And then whatever mm-hmm. Pisces house you have, maybe that's where it will be focused, you know, maybe yeah. it, will, it will be less collective and more kind of dispersed into the Pisces houses. Yeah. I also like the kind of on what you're saying, the, the idea of commitment with this as well. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and maybe the deadline is more of a, a moment where we just decide something, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and make a, a decision. I, you know, traditional Hellenistic astrology says two malefics together equals real malefic. <laughs> it's real malefic is what we say probably in the South. But um, I, I, because I, I come from a couple of different schools, it helps me. And I'll just be honest to think of it in, in a way that is more constructive, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a commitment, a, a decision feels a lot better than like impending doom, you know, mm-hmm. and and I think maybe that ripples out into, you know, into the universe, into your real life. So that's how I'm going to try to choose to to view it. But I do look at it and go, okay, you know what? This helps me if I know what house it's in, in my chart. Mm-hmm. And if I know the themes of that place, I know my chart really well. And if not, go get a session with an astrologer because, you know, it may be something you could look at and say, okay, what is this here and work with rather than, you know, just watching the bowling ball rolling down, you know, at you. So yeah. Um, yeah. Go get a, a session. There's so many astrologers. <laughs> <laughs> There's enough for everybody out there. Exactly. Um, you know, have, having had, you know, Saturn transits where I've physically felt them um, like, you know, you've had teeth issues lately. Like, I, I felt, and I have very small sinuses, so I get sinus infections really quickly, but I had a Saturn transit station on my IC and go back to my South node and station and then go back over it. And, and while it was in between those two, like the, my upper teeth hurt, like I felt like something was sitting on me mm-hmm. and I, I got a session from an astrologer, I got a session from Dan Waits and I just cried through the reading. I was like, you know, it was in my fourth house and I felt the pressure, the responsibility of, of all the fourth house things. And I was like, just, I mean, I was even like slumped. I felt like it was sitting on me. It was like this palpable pressure. And so when I see this, um, you know, especially for what would that be? The sad risings would have Pisces as the fourth. I just, my, my own anecdotal experience of having kind of like a heavy, Saturn transit in the fourth can be, it can feel like crippling. And so if that the eighth, the ninth and the 10th, cause it, when that's applying it, you kind of feel it more, um, that, you know, the world is not ending. It, Saturn and Pisces can be depressing anyway. Um, mm-hmm. but having Mars there and having that activation of pressure, I would just say like, maybe it's just compassion for the self and, mm-hmm and taking it easy to try to ride through it because once Mars moves past, it'll be, it will be much lighter. Um, Mm. but I could see this being like a physical, um, you know, we're so much, so much of our bodies are water and Pisces is water. And I just feel like we can embody that transit in a way that, that we would like a, a lunation or something else that we might feel in the body. So if I would hazard any warning, it's that day might just be just really tough. And to be compassionate for yourself to just, you know, maybe you'll feel energized, you know, maybe you'll have that passion to, to really put frameworks around things and channel energy. But, um, if you aren't feeling that, if that, if that Wednesday just sucks, like just, just wait, (laughs) it's not going to, it's not going to be forever, you know, um, just have, have that compassion for yourself and for your kids and those around you that everyone's going to be kind of experiencing this. That's very true. And if you have anything, it's at 14 degrees. So if you have anything around those degrees of a a mutable sign, especially it's, you know, going to be square conjunct opposite. So have compassion for yourself and other people like I've experienced trines that are not necessarily fun, you know, Mm -hmm. so, um, and this will be my, my moon is 19 degrees Pisces. So, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's almost there. We'll see what happens, you know, but I, (laughs) yeah, the allergies have been terrible for me lately and the teeth thing and it, and I have Saturn at nine Scorpio. So it was a Saturn trine when, when I busted my front teeth out in case the whole wide world doesn't know yet. (laughs) I'm telling them I busted my teeth out during a Saturn trine, but funny enough, I wasn't really happy with the, with those teeth. So (laughs) I'm getting so good. Yeah. 
<laughs> and like Saturn, like when you fix something through in a Saturnine way, it usually lasts a long time. So hopefully you'll have these teeth for a very long time. Yes. I hope so too. <laughs> so the next okay. day, the Kazemi, I, I say that the best thing about retrogrades is that we get a Kazemi. I mean, like we don't get a Kazemi usually until there's a retrograde. I mean, there are definitely other circumstances of that, but that's usually the best part is that we get that Kazemi of mm. Mercury. So completely agree. That's why it's a, you know, sometimes known as a message from the King. That's why I got the wax seal there because you know, something, especially being that it's happening in areas where the solar eclipse is, there's hopefully something comes through as an aha moment. That's kind mm. of what I, I like Kazemi's for aha moments like, Oh yeah, that's the thing that I've been trying to figure out or, or something like that. So um, what, yeah. What is that degree? I also like on your calendar, you have dragons. So I'm wearing my dragon dress at, and Chinese astrology. April is the dragon month and this yeah. is dragon year. So it's a very, and we've got the, you know, the eclipses, we have the nodes here in, in Aries and, and Libra. So it's, a, it, it's a very dragon um, energy. Uh, for, yeah, so it I is. Think, I think it's like the fourth or the fifth is when their month starts. So it's, it's a, uh, but you know, that makes sense. And, and the North node being known as the head of the dragon and the solar eclipse being with mm -hmm. the North node, you know, I, it does speak to how, what a, a voracious appetite this mm -hmm. month has, you know, and, and dragons, you know, do it's so funny that the North node to me is known as, you know, having a voracious appetite because, I don't think I ever imagined a dragon eating until I heard that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, dragons eat. Yeah, that's yeah. right. They do. Yeah. So, you know, people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I dream a lot. I've always had a, like a pretty active dream and dream life. And I dream about dragons a lot. And, um, usually when I dream about dragons, I don't see them. Um, I, see the sh their shadow on the ground and I realize that they're above me or I'm seeing the flames on either side of my head as I'm being consumed by the dragon. I mean, dragons are, or that, that's like the peak. So I do, I practice lucid dreaming and it's definitely a practice of like getting to that point and kind of working within the dream world, but even in like slightly lucid, like somewhat aware dreams, if I have a uh, dragon, it'll be so exciting. It wakes me up. So it's like, I do the practice to kind of call me down and I'll kind of float down and get into a building to get away from the dragon and he'll become smaller so he can chase me more. But dragons are not to be trifled with for sure. And they, um, they like they like barbecued humans. They don't just chomp them. They, they burn them first and then they eat them. At least yeah. in my dream experience, that's what happens to me. So, um, yeah, you gotta get them tasty first, yeah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> get them blackened seasoned, you know, I love it. But yeah. I love the dragon, um, image that you chose for, for the back of the calendar. Cause it, it's appropriate. Absolutely. And yeah. And your dress, it, it is. It, and even, um, even further on into the month, it, I just feel that dragon energy really coming through really, really, really uh, in yeah. so many ways. Yeah. Um, you know, let me Can see. Can we talk about the new moon just for a little bit? So a lot of people yes. will use real basic lunations for intentions and manifestations. So with new moons, I love a new moon. Um, but do you use new moon eclipses for moments of seed planting? Because, you know, the idea of eclipses of big things become small, like, you know, leaders dying or mm. re resigning or whatever, but then small things become great. So how do you use the, the, the eclipses, particularly with new moon and full moons, if you do, um, kind of new moon magic, full moon magic? Yeah, I think I like to, I light a candle every time. And I, you know, I think my intention is just to be in the presence of it. Um, mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting watching it and not being at home this mm -hmm. time because it's going to be, but holding, it's not so much that I use it or practice through it. It's more like I hold space for, mm. for what might come in and, and reverence. I think that's the word. Mm. That's mm -hmm. where I really like to be during a solar eclipse. And if um, I saw the 2017 one and it reverence is really all you can manage when you see them. Yeah. And 
So I think that stuck with me. And so that's how I've treated, you know, even once we can't see just with Mm -hmm. extreme reverence, paying attention as well, you know, watching, um, trying not to be too busy. (laughs) The ones that you do witness yourself, I do feel like do speak to you more personally. So the fact that you're choosing to travel to see it with your own eyes, that in itself is an intention. It's like, yes. you want to see this. And even if you don't have anything beyond that, it's like, you want to be there to witness it because I do feel like wherever the path crosses. So this eclipse path crosses all over the U S and it makes that cross pattern from the prior one. So it's highlighting the United States, at least in its path compared to the one prior. And so the, if you see images of, you know, with the, the solar eclipse, the moon kind of moves in front of the sun, creating that Corona so that we, we can kind of see the edge of the sun. And then it Mm. makes those beautiful lunar shadows on the ground. But then if you look at like a, um, a satellite image of the earth during eclipse, there's a shadow. The moon is like casting this shadow and, and moving. Yeah. So it's like that shadow is going to be you know, down to Durango and through Texas and Arkansas and Indiana, and then through the great lakes and then, you know, the Northeast, uh, and that you're, you're going, you're going to Arkansas. So you'll be really yes. close to kind of that cross pattern, but, um, I will. Yeah, I think- and the new Madrid fault line is right here. In fact, mm-hmm. it goes through new Madrid. Wow. So <laughs> that's, that's crazy to me. Uh, mm-hmm. the new Madrid fault line is, the only really Eastern, especially Southern kind of earthquake zone. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it's been really bad before. Um, there was a 1919 earthquake in Alabama that, that damaged buildings and stuff. So I look at that and I think about the 1800s and Tecumseh's curse, which is a thing. Hmm. Um, it was a native American chief and, and he predicted an eclipse and an earthquake and Hmm. it was the new Madrid that, that happened and i think he his brother was a prophet and and watched the lunations watched eclipses you know knew that they were likely to maybe set off earthquakes but there was a moment where i think everyone respected this chief so much they thought he was a god because Mm. he said the sky will turn black and i think it was just you know all kinds of things um something to read up on But I think about that and I think about what was going on and how we have similar things to say, for instance, the civil war, you know, Mm -hmm. going on right now um, with Neptune and little bitty bits of time and how it all rhymes and how it's going to be this time and the pieces of the puzzle that are all going to be put in. And I do think this eclipse heralds something like that. We're already seeing Texas stuff go on, you know, Um, just, just super interesting, super, super interesting. Ah, the shadow. Yeah. I watched it. You you will definitely have to be a reporter down there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And Folly beach uh, in South Carolina, where I was, I watched the shadow race down the beach and it was just because it was like flat sand. It was just so crazy. And I can't miss it. You know, I, Mm -hmm. who knows? Right. But I can't miss it. Yeah, I'm just inside the the the. Well, I changed it. Sorry. The red line, so I'm not in full view. But the, at the last eclipse last year, I was in a, um, a study group uh, for my astrology school, and I uh, I knew the eclipse was happening, and it was nice enough fall weather, and my door was open, and in my kitchen through the window there were these crescent shaped moon shadows, and I like took my computer because I was on zoom and I was like, blah, look. <laughs> and then I went outside and just like the, the shape of the leaves on the side of the house, you know, m- being that beautiful crescent. And I was well out of the, the viewpoint, but I still got an, the experience of it. You know, I couldn't see the sun cause it was cloudy. Um, mm. but for this one here, I should be able to see portion of it. Cause I'm uh, in Western North Carolina. And it, it's, it's close enough where I'll, I'll, I'll just be in my own yard kind of. Yeah. I think a lot of America will experience that partial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the total is just, you know, there'll be plenty of pictures. If you can't go, I'll, yeah. I'll share them. 
reporting live. Uh, speaking of reporting, um, April 17th, Mercury conjoins Venus and Aries. And it's still retrograde. I didn't put retrograde on there. But, um, you know, that, that gosh, I want to see what degree. Because when I was thinking of Mercury's sun, that Kazemi's 22. And I wanted to tell everyone that 22 degrees of Aries. Well, yeah, um, that week after the Kazemi, we have five days of no major events. <laughs> so yes. just that alone, I mean, there's Mercury is still retrograde and, you know, Mars and Saturn are still together in Pisces and, you know, uh, Jupiter and Uranus are still kind of getting closer together and all that, but there it does. It's like the only break is that, uh, is that one little five day period. <laughs> That's true. Um, the moon goes from. Let's see. What's the last one? The 11th, the Kazemi. So it goes from Taurus all the way. It goes through Gemini on the 12th and 13th, Cancer on the 14th and 15th, uh, and then the 16th, Leo hmm. through the 18th, if it's anyone trining, wants to know. It's trining that Mercury Venus. Yeah. That's right. Leo. Yeah. So Mercury Venus with retrograde is interesting to me and it, it's at uh, 17 degrees. Mm -hmm. So the exact conjunction, the moon's in Virgo at that point, which I do find interesting. So the day before the conjunction, it's trining. And then as it goes into the conjunction, the moon's in a Mercury sign, you know, and mm -hmm. it's really interesting to me that there's that going on. Um, getting a good look at your heart, I think is a good sort mm. of imagery for this. I have the text bubbles because it does seem like there might be some discussions had on that day about mm -hmm. things in your life, especially with, you know, within relationships, that's a Venus thing mm. um, about the space you might need because Venus is an Aries, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, that's what I get anyway. Yeah. 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 That sounds great. <laughs> just kind of like bubble, a brief moment yeah the text bubble like communication it's it, that that feels uh appropriate just for that day and so it's at 17 degrees on the 17th that'll be easy to, <laughs> to remember yeah yes i know and then the 19th we we have the sun moving into taurus which uh yay i like that mm -hmm. um and i like that and this is a good transition into the 20th jupiter uranus conjunction because Mars will sextile the oh. almost exact conjunction on the 19th as it goes into the conjunction. So Mars and Pisces sextile that. So I'll just bring up the chart for these two days because I yeah. feel like that's going to be, um, I know you have a lot to say and there's just a lot of juicy goodness in, in these transits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's Mars 21. Um Nice. And it looks like, so I have the 17th. I may have that date wrong. The Mercury Venus conjunction may be, and this is look, I'm not going to make myself feel guilty because, <laughs> because I got the date wrong. It is not 17 on the 17th. It's 17 it's on the 19th. <laughs> That's a Mercury <laughs> retrograde thing. Yeah, Luckily I can still change it. Astrology in action. Yeah. <laughs> so on the 19th. Okay. Oh, the nineteenth, the same the day. The same day. Wow. Mars is sextile Jupiter and Uranus. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'll fix it. So, do you want to tackle Jupiter Uranus, and then we can talk about why I think the day before Mars sextile might be significant? Yeah. So, just I mean, if if you listen to any astrology podcast or YouTube or conversation at all, like this is like this is the the big shebang and the the reasoning as i understand it is you know jupiter is big he's the big boy in the universe right he gathers things together he expands things that are close and he he's bigger because he kind of um collects things around him and he and he puts it into order and he he's just uh he's the greater benefic so he you know his orbit is um is he's a day chart he's the the day ruler or i'm totally chomping my words because i'm like so excited about this <laughs> jupiter is like he's the big party um planet but he's also the the planet of order and great benefits and 
and he finds his joy in the 11th house of like the collective. And, you know, he exalts in cancer, which is like the, the, the mom kind of taking everything and making it right for everybody. Like he, he has so many jobs, but his whole theme is bringing together. And because he brings things together, he, he is, he just represents like the greater things. He's the greater benefic. He is the big planet in the sky. Um, he's not like a, a wish giver. You know, a lot of people like try to manifest good Jupiter moments because they just want him to give them things. He's not really like that. I mean, he does uh, bestow great gifts. Like he, he finds his join the 11th, which is the house of hopes and dreams. Like the, we dream big, you know, because Jupiter likes to be up there. So if we just think in grand terms of Jupiter, itself but then jupiter's in taurus which is the tangible very pragmatic earthy venusian earth goddess sign that is taurus it's like okay well big things in that earthy sense so mm -hmm. it's like just a a plethora or a cornucopia of of physical tangible realized good things feels like jupiter and taurus but then you have uranus there it was kind of a chaos maker. It's a disruptor. He, um, mm. uh, you know, I, both Jupiter and Uranus have that lightning bolt element to them. Like Jupiter as Zeus, you know, like wielding the lightning bolt. Um, you know, there's a famous Uranus transit when, um, an astrologer a long time ago, you know, was following Uranus and his house got struck by lightning and burned down. And like that to me is like a Uranus moment of like that lightning bolt idea, um, lightning bolt striking your house and burning it down. It's like the, the thing that cracks you open that in the moment might feel malefic, but in the grander sense is, is usually the breakthrough that you needed to get all of the other good things. Mm. So if you combine, like you have a big Mason jar and you combine two different forms of lightning in an earthy sense and shake it up. That's kind of like what's going to happen. Um, and whether this moment itself is like visible, you know, cause we don't see Uranus. You can see Uranus with a telescope, but we mm. don't tend to see Uranus with the naked eye. You can see Jupiter. Um, you know, Jupiter is that bright star. You can see it now. And, uh, you know, when those two come together, it signifies just great things cracking open and being transformative in a realized sign, like, like the fixed earth that is Taurus. So like Steve jobs has this placement in his chart. If you think about somebody that's being born on this moment, because we have to remember we were all born at a transit. That and makes so much to sense be, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, so this, this could just be somebody's born this day that goes on to change the world in a very realized way. Um, but I am uh, expecting something big and yeah. I want it to be beneficial. I want it to be for the collective. I want it to be grand. It's going to speak to my chart very specifically. So I think that's why I'm enjoying like thinking about this. My plan for this day is um, I have one thing scheduled with my friend Terry, who's over in Scotland. So we're going to do like a little tarot um, meetup. And then I'm just going to hang out my yard and I'm going to plant flowers and take it easy and meditate and lay in the sun and do yoga and just be in the presence because I'm expecting some sort of message to come through. And, mm. and just carving out that day, it's a Saturday just carving out that day of just taking it easy to be in a very still place to be in that meditative space and that meditative mind to receive the lightning bolt ideas. That's kind of my general plan. Um, but it may, I feel like it's the one transit that uh, I feel like I undersell it, even though I'm, it feels hyperbolic of what I'm talking about, because it does just seem so fantastical. Those two those two together of all the planets, like those are the ones that are getting together, um, at that very specific degree. Uh, I'm just, I'm excited for it. And I feel like there will definitely be no return after this, whether we realize it that day or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm hoping that I do have some sort of personal message come through because just because of the placement. And then also the fact that, okay, well, we have that stuff in Pisces. We have the stuff in Aries. The, the sun has just moved in. I love that the moon is 
just in Virgo being able to witness it before it moves out. Because when sun Pluto square the next day, the moon isn't visible. So poor, the, poor sun can't see both of her rulers at that point. But in this day, the, the moon is, is at least bearing witness, almost like the moon slowed down to be like, what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that's my, that's my, um, overexcited, uh, anticipation for nothing specific. Cause I have no idea, but I feel like it'll be, um, yeah. it'll be in a tangible form. That's, that's really the only prediction I can, I can think whether it's the, the, the farm protest that's happening over in France feels like this. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is the beginning of, of the planting season for most of the U S you know, like we really don't put, uh, tomatoes out until mother's day, you know, up here in the mountains, but you know, further South, like you're planting stuff now. So it just feels like, a um, the beginning of a season and, and hopefully for the best. Uh, another thing I will say is, uh, you know, with Uranus there and, and Venus ruled sign of Taurus, I wonder about, um, advances in medical treatment and something mm -hmm. that we talked about yesterday with my friend, Janessa, and, you know, is it 3d printing organs so that we don't have to wait for, um, cadavers to be organ donors, you know, is it some sort of breakthrough to be able to get all of the thousands of people off organ donor list to get off dialysis and, and mm -hmm. get off these treatments so that they can get, um, sped up treatment so they can live longer. I mean, like that's, this is the kind of transit that that discovery could be, could happen under. And so mm -hmm. for the, for the benefit of all, I feel like that, like I, I would love for something like that to kind of come to come to form, to be realized. Oh yeah. That's a great, I've had that thought about Uranus and Taurus and also Pluto and, and Aquarius. I mean, mm -hmm. both of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Medical yeah. advances. I think it's interesting too, that it, you know, it answers to Venus who, you know, it, it's interesting being in Aries there. Mm -hmm. I like that the day before Venus and Mercury meet up now that I've got the date, right. Um, <laughs> and I think that that's also significant. The spread really is significant because, mm -hmm. you know, Taurus, Venus rules Taurus, Aries, Mars rules Aries. Mars is in Pisces. Pisces is ruled by Jupiter traditionally. So it goes back. Then it becomes this very focused uh, on these three signs in your chart. And I think that is significant because everyone can kind of not that you ignore where the moon is or ignore where Pluto is, but everything's in these three signs. Mm -hmm. You can see what's going on in your life pretty clearly if you just look at these houses, these three yeah. houses here. Um, yeah, they feel woven together in a, in a real particular way, like a real meaningful way. And the mercury in there as being that stitch to kind of mm. um, bringing it all together. Um, and, you know, we don't traditionally think of like Pisces, Aries, Taurus together. You know, you might mm -hmm. think of like Ori, uh, Ori's. <laughs> See, that's, that's what it is. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, like the first you know, three, you know, you might think of the trigons of the elements, but thinking about this, the, the, the spring equinox, like coming out of Pisces into, into Aries and then into Taurus, it's just thinking about that different sequence of light, but we all have these three signs in our chart, no matter what your co-star app says, like we all have a Pisces house. We all have an Aries house. We all have a Taurus house. So if you have planets there, then those topics of life are going to be highlighted just from all of that woven um, uh, synergy. And so Pisces and Taurus can see each other because they're both yen yes. signs. Um, but there's so much in Aries that you know, even if you don't have Aries placements, the topics of that Aries house will be illuminated um, with the That's node right. there, you know, with um, uh, Venus still there with that Mercury retrograde with Chiron um, and then Mars approaching it, you know, about to come home later this month. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious to hear like the tangential stories of how these things weave because it, they may not seem like clear in the moment because of the line of sight, but mm. they're definitely related. Yeah. And it's, it's activating all modalities, mm -hmm. you know, so really everyone will be yeah. experiencing this in some way because we all have immutable a cardinal or a fixed sign it's something you know yeah. <laughs> generally speaking so 
Uh, and then, yeah, even the fact that, like you said, Pisces sees Taurus, so Mars will be sextile the same day mm-hmm. as Mercury, Venus. That was earlier in the day, though, but Mercury and Venus come together at 17. And that seems significant, too. I mean, Mars being action mm-hmm. and Pisces, eh, you know, but the nature of Uranus being revolutionary and innovative and the nature of Pisces being imagination and dream world. I do feel like there is something about Mars and Pisces that's less lost at this moment and more Mm -hmm. like, you know, clued in to something maybe intuition wise, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then all the rest of the airy stuff, just still hanging out, you know, Chiron, Venus, (sighs) so much <laughs> and and i do think the earth is a good solid predictive kind of thing for this moment like what is it with our um like fossil fuels material mm-hmm. earth things shipping you know um mm-hmm. commerce because taurus is economy it's money it's assets and you have to think of it that way yeah. values being a thing what is our value you know mm-hmm. what do i value Uh, And then thinking about Pisces, spiritually speaking as well, you know, um, Aries for my own desires. It's just this really complicated kind of Mm. a thing too, because, you know, you're thinking of something very practical, Taurus, Mm -hmm. maybe trying to change it with Uranus there. Um, You're thinking of something very active and action oriented Aries and something very spiritual and mystical and it's it's just very complicated to mix all three of those things yeah and maybe it won't be (laughs) well and so one thing I wonder is you know all the crypto dudes out there are they looking at this moment as being like the the pinnacle of bitcoin um but you know if you think about these three houses they're all kind of like huddling up deciding things they're like they've got like secret messengers to kind of tie everything together but then later on in the year, they're going to spread out, you know, Mars is going to get into Aries, you yeah. know, all that stuff's going to go into Gemini and then it's going to be implemented. You know, all the stuff coming into Taurus will be implemented. So it just feels like this huddle, like in football, you huddle to, to have the plan and then you all spread out and do your own thing. So it, it, it again, it might be those seeds of, of, um, uh, I like the idea of compassionate fire compassionately fueled dream with yeah. the, with the Pisces element and Mars seeing the, the, you know, um, the planet of hopes and dreams, Jupiter in a mm. practical sign to make real, you know, I, I like that idea, but yeah, like it just feel, they feel like they're clustered, but then they're going to spread out and all of these, these messages, it's going to be like disseminated through the rest of the year because April's so busy. I don't mm-hmm. feel like we're going to have time to even kind of reconcile it in April. Like we're going to spend May, hopefully laying in our hammocks in the sun, kind of like, how is that actually going to work? You know, that was a good idea. How do I make that happen? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if anything, because some people will see jumps at the time, it's so funny how different people experience this. You'll have people who it definitely, you know, sow to seed that Mm sprouts and then some people will be going through the moment in that time Mm. and you'll see that and it'll be represented to you and maybe a story you hear about someone else and it's also happening in your life it just hasn't been you know it hasn't come to fruition yet but it already has you just don't know it and there's all these really interesting things that come up at this time so I'm interested to see you know what people are actually going to be you know actually having a life change in the moment Mm -hmm. at which people you can trace it back to that moment yeah. when they do, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's such a, it's such a cool, interesting time. It's interesting. another reminder to just write things down, journal it. You don't know, like it might seem and it might seem insignificant, especially at the eclipse day and this mm. day, like write it down, you know, mm-hmm. just write it down and date it. So you know exactly when you wrote it down. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially with Mercury retrograde. You know, another thing I think about is the power grid. I think about stuff mm. like that and the solar mm-hmm. flares we've been having lately. 
so many possibilities. So get your surfboard out. And in fact, I have a little alien on a surfboard here. Love him. Love him. <laughs> and he's the doing the transition thing. You know, I yeah. switched the calendar really quick. I deleted that thing. Um, <laughs> so embarrassed about that. Uh, so surfboard is a good idea. Waves, you know, mm-hmm. earthquakes, maybe not literally, but definitely at some point. Um something shaky with Uranus. I mean, as much as it's probably yeah. not going to be, it, it doesn't have to be bad shaky. It's just be ready for it, you know? Um, and then the Jupiter Uranus conjunction to have the chameleon because it does feel a little bit like a change that is so fundamental. You, you know, you look differently, you mm-hmm. know, like almost like that. Yeah, uh, earthquake, earthquake for that day, just in the symbolic or archetypal sense of an earthquake, it's like, in the moment, it's scary, you know, things are cracking open, um, but it doesn't have to necessarily stay uh, broken, you know? No, and it like, releases pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, uh, you know, Taurus is a seventh house. You know, if you have Scorpio rising, Taurus is a seventh house. Is this a breakthrough in relationship? You know, if you're, um, you know, Aries rising is this Taurus in your money house, kind of a breakthrough in that money and like that shift and like being fired from a job that you hate, but then being able to be free to follow your passion, you know, having that, that Mars sextile it and like really fueling it. So it's like in the moment, losing your job sucks, yeah. but then you are free to then pursue and climb kind of that next mountain. So exactly. So I, I like earthquake for, for that moment is uh, a lot. Yeah. 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 It's a good, a good visual, uh, in your mind's eye. Mm-hmm. And then the next day, the 21st, we have sun square Pluto, um, sun in Taurus. So from that same area, it, it's kind of continual because mm-hmm. I, I can see that square being such tension with Pluto, such power and such change and such, um, it's the fist. I mean, that's kind of what, what I get from that is, you know, Oh no. And this is going to be, I'm just going to give out like a crazy, crazy thing that would never happen so that we can just, (laughs) for instance, Jupiter conjunct Uranus, the Mississippi river dried up. That would never Mm -hmm. happen. Right. I mean, maybe, maybe an earthquake happens. The Mississippi drains. I don't know, but the sun square Pluto, we've got to figure something out. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's basically like that. And Pluto being an Aquarius, such a um, it's almost a global sign. It is the, the bird's eye view, you know, and the sun and Taurus that, okay, what about my garden? You know, what about my stuff and how do I, um, reconcile that in that moment? I think, Mm -hmm. um, and it's the first opening square. So, you know, as the sun moves through the year, it'll oppose Pluto. It'll do a third quarter square. It'll come back and conjoin it. And watching those moments is really good um, for, I mean, I think looking at world events, Pluto is a good indicator. I don't mm-hmm. often use Pluto a whole lot, but, but exact moments, you know? Um, so I think, you know, maybe I think we're likely to see something that whole entire weekend. If we're looking at news stories and things like that. Yeah. Maybe even Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's going to be a, a very, um, I'm going to avoid saying interesting again. Because <laughs> I've said it like 800 times. Go to, I, I have to go to the, the thesaurus.com to like look at different words. I'm like, I'm tired of saying this one word. And I've been writing um, about the Deccans a lot more. And so I've been using thesaurus a lot. I've been like, I'm sick of my words because I'm, I know what I'm trying to say, but my vocabulary needs a breakthrough. Um, but I was going to just speak about, you know, sun square Pluto. So last year when Pluto had moved into Aquarius, did we have, we had a sun square Pluto, right? Because it, it happened. Maybe. Yeah. I think it was my, my solar return in May had Pluto in Aquarius. So it, it must have, it must have crossed. Can you look that up from mm-hmm. last year Absolutely. And just to see when that was, because so you know, with Pluto and Aquarius, it's going to be there for the next 20 years. Right. So we're going to have these squares. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll have the, the opposition for Leo sun. We'll have the square with Taurus and Scorpio suns. Yeah. And, um, you know, that in itself feels like it, it's, it, it's like a challenging thing to then overcome. But when I think of Aquarius, I think of the star card in Tarot. 
And it's a woman who has one foot in the water and one foot on the ground. So she, she's connected in that, that emotional intuitive sense. And then she's holding a vessel that's, you know, pouring water. So it's the water bearer. It's the connection between the gods and human. And so Aquarius is the vessel or the container for that, that communication, that knowing that intuition. So, you know, what is it about Pluto as such a powerful planet, mm. very, uh, very, very small, unassuming planet that is just like diamond forged. He's so like condensed. And so his power is very particular and to have, have the, of all the planets have the sun squaring Pluto feels like two very powerful things squaring each other. And yeah. what is it about the touch point of Aquarius being that star channel for it's like straight up information from the gods. Like what are they trying to make you, what are they hitting you over the head with trying to make you pay attention to what kind of, if you're not paying attention to the, the signals, the small little Plutonian omens that they're dropping, they're going to like slap you in the face with it. That's so true. And, and having that, that square, we're going to have that square for like 20 times. So yeah, like something that we're going to have to go through and like get better at as we go through these transits. So um, mm -hmm. especially in these early degrees with it mm -hmm. being so the first one you're right was April 20th of last year and it was a mm -hmm. new moon mm -hmm. so that was interesting to to kind of look at and go oh wow that was a really big opening mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that and now we've got one. yes and now we've got this one April so almost a, a year ago from this date exactly it was April 20th last year now it's April 21st so mm -hmm. um it's, it's, I guess the first this year for sure. Um, and paying attention to it yearly is really mm -hmm. a thing to get clued into as, and then when Pluto gets into a different deck and, you know, watching mm -hmm. the subtle changes yeah. in that, it's really cool. Uh, but I agree with everything you said. And I, I really like what you said about uh, it being diamond forged. And so mm. condensed Pluto yeah. energy feels a lot like that to me as well. So yeah, that whole weekend just <laughs> condensed yes. <laughs> and then a full moon, you know, to top it all off because why not full moon Let's and throw a full moon in there. <laughs> I know. And so I guess that'll be T square Pluto. Not exactly. It'll be just past the, the exact moment, but close enough to probably be dealing with some of the reverberations from the mm. sun square Pluto, I would think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the fact that we had eclipses there recently and these, you know, this full moon being in an area where we just maybe went through, um, a change or, mm -hmm. um, something like that. This, this is interesting as far as Scorpio goes. Um, I don't think there's, let me make sure there's, I don't know what it might be. Um, cause this is the first Scorpio lunation. That's not a part of the eclipse cycle. Yeah think it might be let me just double check that um because we talked last time about how there's no aries lunar eclipses that were all solar um yeah. because last year there was that one final um taurus eclipse and then it was a libra lunar eclipse right last fall so there wasn't well, an yeah. aries one um yeah the last the last um full moon in Scorpio was May 5th of last year. And that was an eclipse. You're right. So this mm -hmm. is the first full moon in Scorpio without the South node there. And yeah. I think that's what I was tuned into. I was like, this one's going to be different than the mm -hmm. last few full moons in Scorpio. Yeah. Um, thank goodness. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's so it's not touching anything except for the, t the, you know, two degree T square with, Pluto. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just share it just quickly. Um, here we go. So four degrees of Taurus. I mean, well, the sun is at four degrees of Taurus. Mm -hmm. The moon's at four degrees of Scorpio. Pluto's at two of Aquarius. So yeah. Past it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's really, it's kind of making itself known. Pluto is like, Hey, I'm here. Let me just be the only thing that touches this full moon, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mars is getting closer to Neptune and that's significant because Mars rules Scorpio traditionally. So mm -hmm. there is a, a mystical sense that I got that feeling. It, it feels a little mystical being water, 
having Mars close to Neptune. Um, I know Scorpio gets, you know, kind of a, sometimes a bad rap for being, you know, dark and, and deep and, you know, power and, uh, and it can kind of be a little too dark sometimes. I think the, the water element with Scorpio is really significant. So to have the full moon and water with Mars and Neptune together just feels like, you know, if you were going to do magic, it's probably a good time to do it. Even though Venus mm-hmm. is in Aries, you know, something like that. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I like, a, I like a Scorpio moon um, just in general. Uh, the mm-hmm. moon is the moon is exalted in Taurus. So on the, uh, the opposing sign it's um, fallen in Scorpio. Mm-hmm. And uh, that just means it's like, it has to work hard. Yeah. And I, I just appreciate a hard working planet. So when the moon is there, it really does work hard, but it can work hard in, in that magical sense. I mean, um, you know, I don't think that there's one sign that's more magical than the other. If, the, if there was in a practical sense, I would think it would be Virgo, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but Scorpio, they have a bad rap of being dark, but, uh, you know, they're just, it, it's a, it's a, it's a Mars, a yin Mars sign. So it likes, it has that internal fire, that internal passion. Um, and it's where the, the moon falls. So it's like, it's like the most goth of all of them, but I mean, it's not necessarily, um, I mean, Capricorn is the more realized, like dark sign uh, 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 as opposed to Scorpio. Scorpio has capacity to go to depths that I think the rest of us would just balk at you know yes. like Scorpio will just go there and they want to see the bottom they want to see the full picture and so a full moon in Scorpio is like the moon is reflecting the maximum amount of light and so with with a Scorpio energy with that it's like illuminating all of the dark corners and and some people don't like to look at that you know mm-hmm. I think that's why they get a bad rap of like they're willing to shine light um and deep sea dive into the dark depths of our psyches and they're comfortable doing that and they're capable of surviving. It's almost like those divers that train that can breathe underwater for Mm -hmm. longer periods of time, those pearl divers, like that's Scorpio. They're, they're capable of going to those depths and returning where the rest of us would die, you know, from what, what is it that the bubbles in the brain from like the bins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like Scorpio just has that capacity. And so with a full moon and Scorpio, we we all get to experience like what does that capacity look like for us um yeah that's I'm, a beautiful I'm partial way of putting to, it i'm partial to a to a scorpio moon just because I, I just see how hard that they have to work you know yeah absolutely and they do and you're right it is someone not afraid of things like the taboo or you know if taurus is the rock scorpio is what's underneath the rock you know it's the <laughs> the bugs and the yeah. and which are essential and you know sometimes it's nice to turn the rock over and look mm-hmm. at what's underneath it and some people are scared of it so yeah. it, it very much is it's and i think that's why um especially in pop astrology, sun sign astrology, you hear, Oh, you're a Scorpio, you know, like all of, uh, all of those things. And it it really does kind of wear on me sometimes. So that's why I'm like, yes, I know the moon's fallen there, but I agree. I'm partial to it because it can, I mean, if you want to talk about loyalty, that's Scorpio. So yes, the moon has fallen maybe because of the loyalty, maybe because of the, Mm. the fact that they want to go deep with people and it hurts you know, it hurts to be separated from something that you are that connected with. Some people would say obsession, you know, goes with Scorpio and it it definitely does. So the full moon there square Pluto um, has the potential to be a a little uh, wonky, maybe. Um, Mm, Defiant. That's kind of how it feels. It's like, you know, the, the sun and Taurus, Pluto and, and Aquarius and the moon and Scorpio, like those, those three, I mean, there's nothing in Leo because they would join the party if we invited them. Like they're For all sure. very defiant because they, mm-hmm. their job is to, to sustain light. And when they're in a square with each other, they're, they're just kind of at odds with each other. So, but you learn so much from being like faced with things and there's no way around it. You, you are more fortified when you overcome them. Um, one last analogy for Scorpio. I, I like to think of is the compost pile. Yes. Like, you have that rich black 
earth that is from the decayed bodies of all of your soups and and salad greens and um you know you get it, it to have good compost you have to till it up and you have to have different sources of fuel and and it has to have time and it has to sit and it has to um, grow into becoming that black gold. And then you get to grow new things out of it. And Scorpio, it's like the compost pile doesn't always have life in it. Like I usually get avocado trees out of mine just because the avocado pits take off, but, um, you take that and then you get to grow beautiful flowers in the Taurus part, you know, but you get that because of that rich decayed part of that cycle. It's like the balsamic moon phase is like that Scorpio energy to me. It's, it's, For sure. it's necessary decay and death are necessary because without it, then life would be endless and not really celebrated because we need to have that foil. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, yeah. that's a great analogy. And, and especially the fact that the last full moon in Scorpio had the South moon. It's like, we just pro- we probably did a lot of tilling recently yeah. in that area, you know, yeah. and a lot of kind of turning up the the pile. And so this is like when you kind of put your shovel down and, you know, taking a look at it and you're like, okay, mm-hmm. is it good enough? Did I do it good yeah. enough? You know? Yeah. I love it. I, I like this full moon. I'm not, um, it does feel a little bit like maybe a mini Halloween in the middle of April, yeah, but it yeah. feels good. Um, yeah. And, and the fact that Mercury is going slow right then as well, Mercury mm-hmm. starts to slow down because it goes direct in, in Aries on the 25th um, and uh, Mars being kind of the, the thing, you know, even with a full moon in Scorpio, you know, there's mm-hmm. all this Aries going on and yeah. a full moon in Scorpio. Mars is like a, a super focus right now, you know, mm-hmm. and Mercury is the, the thing I found my little, uh, the thread. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where we're at is this, point right here in the calendar and it's April 25th. So we reached it March 18th with the North or the South, no, the North node (laughs) and uh, retrograded at 27 April 1st. And then we've made it all the way to April 25th. So Mm -hmm. it's that last turning bend of the stitch before you pull out, you know? Yeah. Um, What does, is the moon, I wonder if the moon is still It's probably changed by that point. Let me see. No, it's still in Scorpio. That's, that's the one I saw. Uh, Um, I was thinking about this earlier. I could not remember what point where I saw that the moon was in Scorpio and it made so much sense, but Mercury goes direct April 25th with the moon in Scorpio, exactly opposite Jupiter and Uranus. Uh Uh-huh. And it, it, it is, it's a thread, like even the moon being opposite Jupiter and Uranus drawing attention to that conjunction, mm-hmm. Mercury being at the North node, drawing attention to the eclipse. Um, and then Mars and Neptune being together, drawing that, that attention back to Pisces in this moment. Trining that moon. Yeah. Trining the moon. Yeah. It's so perfect. Perfection. Yes. <laughs> good job and, stars <laughs> and pluto is still kind of talking to the sun there a little bit but it's not it's a, the, the sun is moving away so i think that the effects of that square are are easing uh, a little bit i i love that that moon mars trine there you know yeah yeah because um mars has just you know sextiled jupiter and uranus it's like it's bringing that message forward almost to neptune Mm-hmm. Like Mars is like, Hey, look at what just happened. I got to tell you about it. You might not have seen it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it looks like there's a slight contra between Mercury and Saturn there. Like they're supposed to add up to 30 and it's, it's a little, it's like 31. So I bet the day yeah. before or no, actually probably the day after since Mercury's direct and contra are like secret opposition. So there's some sort of tension point between that Saturn and Pisces and that Mercury and Aries. Mm. Um, it's a good catch. Good call yeah. because, uh, and I'm, th- I'm thinking about uh, how it all just is so it all answers to each other r- mm-hmm. in this moment, you know, because Saturn is ruled by Jupiter and, and the fact that those three signs like the Taurus can see Pisces, 
-hmm. but Aries and Pisces can't see each other and Aries and Taurus can't see each other and how interesting that interplay is. Um, I think this moment is really a, a, like the engine gets started, you know, Mm -hmm. like if, if there was um, a lot of imagination or some things changed or whatever the case in April, whatever you experience, this moment is like, Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe that's the contra and Tisha because you know, there's going to be work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not aware of it though yet. I don't know, but there's definitely going to be some. Yeah. And like, I don't know what you would call it, but like, so Saturn over there in Pisces is, is fallen in Aries and Mercury in Aries is fallen in Pisces. So like, there's Mm -hmm. like this tension of, okay, well maybe we don't have all the tools that we need to do this, but we're going to have to figure it out. And, and contra and is like under the table tension of like, I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but there is something there. Um, yeah. And, and maybe like the clarity will come as Mars kind of burns through Neptune and then gets home in Aries. Um, maybe there'll be more clarity there, but I, I always spot Antitia and Contra Antitia and I don't quite always know how to use it. It's like, yeah. I always see them, you know, I, I play around with it, but I, 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 um, I don't know how to put it into practice yet. Yeah. You, know, you were saying to the, the, I don't know exactly how they're in each other's fallen signs and it mm-hmm. mutual deception came yeah. to my <laughs> instead of mutual reception. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, mutual, you know, because they're both kind of working on, things that may, um, trip the other up. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and there will be, uh, Saturn moving into Aries in what a year mm-hmm. or do we have a year, a little, little less or a little more or something like that. I think it's next year that it happened. Yeah. Yeah. As it, it's going to be a wake up call probably. So mm-hmm. Saturn and Pisces, you know, it's just kind of like, Oh, it, it can wait a little bit, maybe, you know, instead of working yeah. on it, like it should. And Mercury yeah. and Aries is like, no, 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 we need to get going on this. So, yeah. um, yeah, it's this like putting little... a cloth over your dishes instead of doing it. It's like, I just don't want to see them, <laughs> you know, and then in Saturn moves in Aries and it's like, uh, smash the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's Take a great, only. <laughs> Great imagery for that. Right. Uh, meanwhile, Mercury is busy making the dishes right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, dirtying them up. <laughs> oh goodness. So yeah, cool, cool moment. Uh, I think it's gonna be one, even though there is that mutual deception and contra stuff going on, you know, it does seem like the moon trining Mars that they're up to their own hmm. things mm-hmm. that have an important place, but there may be some work to do when Mars gets in Aries because Mars is, is, you know, maybe a little deceived by Neptune as it gets there. Is it April 28th? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. The 28th. And it's floating a little bit. Whereas Mercury really wants to get started. Venus has done been trying to get started. You know, <laughs> Venus is like, I've been working and you are um, just, you know, smoking weed in the backyard or something. What are you doing? (laughs) Yeah. So uh, that to me is like, okay, once we get past this point, as much as it'll be cool, because I think the summer is going to be really relaxing towards the rest of tour season when Venus moves in there, it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost like there's still going to be things we want to do that we wish maybe we'd done a month ago, you know, or Mm -hmm. something like that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but high on the um high on the image of like wizard i think mars and <laughs> neptune i love that you know wizard gets me on that and in fact yeah. i think on the calendar i put not only a wizard but a space cadet you know oh, or, yeah. because it, it is both it's not either or it's both yeah. you know you know we're equally as kind of escapist as we are wielding that intuition for our Mm. own power, you know, for Mm -hmm. our own good, I think. So if that makes any sense. (laughs) Yeah. And there's a, there's a, the sense of, you know, April 1st really through until the 21st, it just feels like 
one thing after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And the moon is kind of like, look at all that you have done. Look at this, like, look at the, look, like, look back, you know, Venus rule. Venus is like a reflective like planet, right? And Venus rules Taurus. So once we're in Taurus, it's be like, let's kind of consider all of this mess that we've made, you know, all of the changes that we had, you know, when you're really busy, you don't always put all the clutter away on the counters and you don't clean out your car and you don't answer all the emails. And it's like, you don't, you can't keep up. And like the full moon moment is like, let's you, do you see this mess? Like you've done a lot, (laughs) not going to blame you. You haven't had time. Mercury goes direct and it's like, you're still kind of untangling all of it. And the Mars Neptune does feel like the untangling of like, we have to kind of put all this, we have to make sense of it. And some of that making sense might be that we have to make magical sense of all these shifts because they're pretty, pretty major. I Mm -hmm. mean, to have all of this stuff happen in one month is like, of course, Aries, you know, would choose to, to, you know, volunteer themselves to be the month that all of this stuff happens because Aries likes to be busy, you know? Um, but th- there's a sense of untangling and, and then reweaving or restitching, you know, and the, the Mars Neptune, um, my, my friend Sonia yesterday talked about Mars going through Neptune as having to take off his armor and like have his armor melted before he like enters into Aries again. And I really liked that image of like kind of surrendering the, the warrior archetype to then get new, um, to get new armor when he comes home, like that, that final push before he comes home. But that sense of just the, the sorting and the untangling and the reorganize reorganization from all of the activity that happened in April starts. It feels like that's just part of it, um, with that Mars Neptune conjunction. That it, you're so right. And it resonates a lot with me and, and even my own plans, like mm-hmm. my April is so busy and some of that busy is vacation, Mm -hmm. but you know, it's like what I'm going to be gone the first weekend for the eclipse. I'm going to be gone the third week to the beach because some friends invited us down and it's like, awesome. I'm excited, but it's also Mm -hmm. like, Oh, we've got two trips back to back. And then in between I'm playing these gigs and then I've got the astrology stuff and I can see the end of April being like, I know I have vacation, but now I've got to like yeah. put everything back and, and yeah. make sure I'm on top of my stuff. And, you know, being a musician, the chords tangling really resonates with me because, mm-hmm. you know, having to trace the end of the chord because there's a knot you can't get undone and just working it is, it's just something very real, I think, with Mercury retrograde mm-hmm. than going direct and Mars finally, and this brings us to the 29th and 30th, Venus and Mars moving, moving into the respective places of power is, you know, a time to, yeah, now we can actually, Venus is working really well in this Taurus area. Mars is working really well in this mm-hmm. Aries area. So now is the time we, you know, start to act and it just keeps, there's little things that click into place as we get toward the end of the month, like you said, that start that process, you know, like, okay, all right, let's look at the mess. Okay. Let's start picking it up, untangling it. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, now that we've set, sort of done that, let's um, work on the goals or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. That last week is really kind of the, the reconciliation of all the change and mm-hmm. that we'll deal with that for a long time, like through the summer, you know, Mars is going to go retrograde later. Mercury is going to go retrograde later, both in Leo, right? So, I mean, like the the fire trigon this year is going to be active with the retrogrades. Um, but, you know, I mean, like the making a mess and cleaning it up, like that's kind of the, the ebb and flow, the in and out of life. So just feels concentrated for April. And um, the new moon or sorry, the full moon kind of is like the hopeful point of like, if we can just get there, like that's yeah. why I say one day at a time, because like every single day is just a different challenge you know i should have my own una reverse card in my pocket just be like can i can i switch the circumstance um but then when we're on the other side of it we get to just enjoy the new paradigm the new shift the new breakthrough the new you know uh if there's an earthquake in my yard and it uncovers that i have this huge quartz you know pocket you know because i pull quartz out of my yard all the time like i would love like this huge 
you know, multi pointed courts to pop out of my ground, you know, and I, then I, when I'm in Taurus, I can just enjoy that. But, um, we're definitely going to be working and, um, it, it can be a little exhausting. I think that's why Taurus is ca- called kind of a lazy sign. Cause we, d- we do like to lay in the hammock. We do like mm-hmm. to just enjoy. Um, but it's partly because we follow Aries, which is always just going you know it's ruled by the sun and mars <laughs> right they're, they're like they just burn up and they burn bright and taurus is ruled by the moon and venus like we get to enjoy all the efforts from um from all that aries energy so yeah one day at, one day at a time for me yeah and the goal of the end of the month is going to be yeah i really am excited about venus and taurus more than I mean, normally I'm excited about it, but there's something about this mm. specific month where I, this Venus and Taurus ingress just really brings in some beautiful astrology. And, you know, as a quick sort of little preview for May, like, oh man, I'm really excited about May. There's a Venus Jupiter conjunction at the last degree of Taurus. The sun is still there. There's a new moon with Uranus, maybe. Um, just really, really beautiful yeah. things that that make all of the work in April and all of the perhaps stress, confusion, whatever it is that you're feeling, shock, awe, you know, all of the mm-hmm. things like, ah, you know, okay, it was either worth it or it's working out or right. I'm seeing the um, the results of it and they feel good. Just mm. it does feel like if this gets too much to have that in your mind that May is going to be some really, really nice gifts, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Last March. Gosh, was it last March? Like Gemini, Mars went direct and like Saturn went into Pisces and Pluto went into Aquarius. It's like all these things just like back to back to back to back to back. And everybody was, all the astrologers were like that last week of March is just going to be busy, you know, like it's just going to be loud. And it definitely was like, I had that rat episode. (laughs) I had, um, I mean, it was like a, a very, it was a very personally busy and just collectively like loud, uh, month. And, and everybody was saying like, that's kind of the chunk of time to pay attention to, and then it will filter out. And then the summer will be like pick up again and it kind of is tracking, but it's just moved down a month. It's like April is the, is the busy time and we'll have that reprieve in May. And maybe it's the, you know, May has some really nice astrology in addition to it, just not being crazy. <laughs> so mm. it's not like, it's just a reprieve. It's a reprieve with like lots of um, just beautiful moments because when we get into June, all that stuff goes into Gemini it's just going to be very chatty, you know, Jupiter going into Gemini and then all those planets. I think May 24th is kind of like a, is a, is a big day with, with a lot of planets going into Gemini and yeah, um, like it's going to speed up. So May will be that, um, May is like the hammock. You know, if I'm going to make my own Sabian symbol for all of May, it's the hammock. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. And yeah, I think you're right with the Gemini stuff incoming. It's very, chatty very busy um but busy in a different way than the Aries busy was Mm -hmm. you know busy maybe parsing out information and um I mean you can see here we've got let's say I'm in 2023 how did that happen um Jupiter moving in Venus moves in with Jupiter the sun Mm -hmm. so we have new and full moons there they interact with Saturn that's going to be a thing Um, so when we have all this and I've tried to tell people, I'm like, enjoy me. Like if you Mm -hmm. get a chance, please. And it's funny because the hammock does totally fit. I mean, with, with everything moving kind of in this hammocky position, Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's going to be great. But the, I think even the Gemini stuff is less, um, intimidating to me. We have cancer stuff after Mm -hmm. that, which I think is going to be great. I think it's August where I start to get more intimidated by the astrology. Well, I just look at like the spread of planets. (sighs) Like that's kind of the norm. It's like you have it all over the place compared to now, which is all huddled up in the Pisces, Aries, Taurus. Like this is kind of like usual sign. Like you'll, as an astrologer, you'll have those people come in and they, you look at their chart and you're like, whoa, it's like all in 
Capricorn Aquarius, or it's all here. You know, you, you'll see those. It's just like a bunch of tiny little lines. If you have the aspects showing of like, it's all concentrated. That's, those are rare they, they don't last that long, you know? Right. Um, and so this, it's like, well, at least it'll be spaced out <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. The mutables are going to get kind of, you know, bounced around around this time. Mutable signs are going to have a thing uh, mm -hmm. with August and September. So it's just yeah. a little preview here. This is why this preview is why we're saying, you know, April probably is it going to be, I, honestly, I don't think it's going to be as stressful as August and September, even with the mm -hmm. big eclipse. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of things happening for, for us maybe mm -hmm. rather than, you know, all the outside information flying around election year stuff. Like mm -hmm. this is more like for our personal lives yeah. in a way, whereas that feels less and, and, you know, maybe that's because it's Saturn and there's Virgo and there's um, Gemini. It's just all over the place, you know. Mm -hmm. But this moment, however weird, stressful, um, exciting, whatever you you are having in April, you know, it is for you. I think that's with an yeah. Aries flair, you know, like that mm -hmm. is you. It's for you. It's for your values, Taurus. Pisces, yeah, it's more of a collective sign, but it's, it's your subconscious that you couldn't get any more you than your subconscious, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that being said, enjoy May. <laughs> right. <laughs> enjoy May, enjoy uh, even June, even July, August, I, I guess even late July with the Mars Uranus conjunction gets me mm -hmm. a little bit too. So mm -hmm. it starts kicking up. So this, this summer is like, it's given me super summer vibes early on, like yeah. real awesome summer vibes, which I really, yeah. really like. Um, and that part of it makes me, I mean, we both sort of live in the South. I'm more South than you, but I would still call North Carolina South, you know? So yeah. um, the, the heat here kicks up a little earlier mm -hmm. than some of the Northern States. And so I'm already getting some of that in my, you know, I have little plums on my plum tree and mm -hmm. little blueberry bushes. And so I'm like, yeah, maybe this early beach trip will be a good thing, even though it's April 20th. Um, you know, <laughs> so gonna you're going to be on the ocean during that conjunction moment. Yeah. I don't think there's many tsunamis in the Gulf that have ever been recorded. Yeah. No, <laughs> but maybe there'll be like some like wild, um, like bull shark migration yeah. that you'll see, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You do have those in the Gulf. Yes, and stingrays are, you know, can kind of huddle up in the waves. And they, it's really cool the way they will surf the waves and you can see them mm -hmm. when the wave moves. <clears throat> it's a really good um, kind of Uranus, Jupiter sort of surf in the waves thing. Yeah. Even though I know it's not a water sign, I just get that kind of wiggly Im mm -hmm. imagery, you know, mm -hmm. about the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. And, and man, that's what made, has made April such a hot spot for me since maybe two years ago. I think I've looked, mm -hmm. you know, into this and it reminds me so much of the Capricorn eclipses mm -hmm. in December, 2019 and what was going on with that. And there's so many reverberations from that and 2021 when uh, Jupiter and Saturn came together at the beginning mm -hmm. of Aquarius, just like Pluto just ingressed Aquarius. And so it's a, a little bit of a reverberation and that's why it feels more personal. That Capricorn felt very outer world. It yeah. is, I can't do anything about it. I, I mean, structures, it's like authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And this airy stuff is like me, you know, mm -hmm. what, who am I, what do I want to be doing and where do I want to go? What do I want to do with my energy? Um, what is directing me in my value system, even, you know, in my, you know, consciousness. So I've been looking at this at, for a long time as a moment where everyone kind of becomes aware, not in that kind of, you know, hokey woke sense, but like becomes aware of something that, you know, maybe has been building for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing that, that kind of filters up for me is, you know, uh, having lots of Taurus in my chart, 
I'm well aware of the disparaging um, reputation of Taurus of being slow and, you know, lazy or complacent or stubborn, but there's a sense of natural timing that Taurus embodies. Um, if you've had a child before going through labor, even if like even a C-section, every child kind of has its own sense of timing. And especially when they grow, like every child starts walking at their own time. They start talking at their own time. They, they have their own time that they are able to get ready in the morning. They have their own time that they walk down the sidewalk. Like everybody has a natural circadian rhythm that is kind of uh, it might be annoying to people that are fast walkers. If you have a slow walker, I mean, just basic, For sense, sure. but Taurus has this embodied way of timing things that just happen to happen in the right time. And it can't be necessarily like quantified on paper. Uh, and so the, 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 the reputation of being slow comes from that of like, well, I was actually filling up my time with all these other things that I was doing that I didn't really care to get there when you wanted me to get there. Mm -hmm. And, and if we think about energy and value kind of being bound up with Venus and Aries, you know, like the, the value that, that Venus holds for us. And then the energy of that martial sign of Aries. And to me, I think of like the value of time is so potent. And Absolutely. so maybe that is a breakthrough that we can kind of come to like time is money because time is energy, right? Mm -hmm. And so how we spend our time represents what we value. It's like vote with your dollars. It's like vote with your time too. Mm -hmm. And maybe the breakthrough is like, how much time am I willing to give to something? Because that I'm channeling energy. So the channel of Saturn, like Saturn is that framework and the Mars next to it. It's like, may, I'm hoping that those are those kind of hard to, hard to, um, verbalize, obviously what all those three houses are trying to do to each other because they're all working so closely together. That's kind of what keeps like, you get these little bubbles of like, Oh, what was that? What I wanted? Was that what I was, was thinking of? But that's kind of what's bubbling up for me is the sense of value with Taurus and Jupiter and Uranus. And then the, the channeling of energy through that Pisces, um, Saturn, the malefics, you know, the malefics yeah. saying no to things is actually great. You know, yes. the malefics say no. And like Jupiter and Venus always say yes, but that always saying yes is not always a great thing for you as the individual. No, so that that's roughly what I'm hoping kind of comes through it. And I think you're spot on about it being Aries. It's like the empowerment of me and, and the choice and, and what I can do for myself. I'm kind of operating from my best version of myself. Then I can bring that forward to other people um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm hoping reflects through, but that's my general word salad of like what this whole month I'm hoping will, will bring forward because yeah. that's kind of what keeps kind of bubbling up for me. Uh, when I look at these charts and I think about just the month in general, I'm taking it one day at a time, just like a good tourist should, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I wanted to share two, two omens that came to me recently. One came at three 40 this morning. So um, in between eclipses always feel like kind of hidden time, you know, like things that just come out of, you know, they feel more powerful or they, yeah. they get my attention in a clearer way. So I have lots of trees around me. I have lots of birds and, uh, I have a screech owl that sometimes lives in my backyard, but I have this new family of hawks and the teenage hawks are like really loud and obnoxious and they piss off the crows and they make the owl kind of go away because the owl is pretty small. But then yesterday, so I talked to all the birds whenever I'm out there, I'm like, Hey, Turkey, like, woo, 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 you know, like just whatever comes through, there was beautiful red tailed hawk that flew right over my head. And I was like, Oh, Hey Hawk. And then I looked and it had this huge rat in its claws. And the rat was like squealing as it, like the claws are probably digging deeper and deeper. Oh my God. And I was like, good Lord. That was like he could have dropped the rat in my head was the first thing I thought of. <laughs> I have like this rat thing. Well, you did last March too. I know, I know. And um, so it felt like the eclipse path, you know, like the, the hawk path of the rat and the talons was like right over my head as I was like, oh, hey, pretty bird with the pretty feathers. Um, so that was one omen. So I, I pay attention to those like kind of crazier moments that happen in between the eclipses because they do feel like they're momentous. I don't know what it means, but yeah. I definitely wrote it down and I wanted to say it out loud. But then also this morning, 
um, at three forty, I heard a, I heard glass crash in the house, and so I thought at first one it woke me up, and I thought okay the cat maybe knocked over something, and and my husband said uh, the cat's in the bed, so I was like oh it's not the cat that knocked it over. So I, we jumped out of bed and I kind of ran in here and I like jumped on the bench. Cause I thought it was another animal, maybe a rat that was like running around. Yeah. Um, and I, we couldn't see what was going on. We didn't hear anything. And then we looked and the clock that was on the wall, this big, like kind of schoolhouse clock had fallen off the wall and had knocked over a hurricane lamp that had belonged to his grandfather. That's sad. Smashed all over the ground. And I, it was three forty, so I like noted the time as yeah. a, a good astrologer would, of like what does it mean? That, and Morgan was like, "Look at the clock. Did it stop? Like the clock <sighs> stop? It did not stop. It kept going, but it felt symbolic somehow, you know. So it's like I wanted to say that out loud for other people who are having these weird things in between the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. Sometimes these little omen stories happen, and I like to write them down to, to kind of timestamp them so that I can go back to them later, like you know, what does it mean? At first I was like, somebody died. <laughs> That's right. Thought, you know, somebody died in the middle of the night. Um, I haven't gotten the call yet. So I am knocking on it. Hopefully that, that didn't happen, mm-hmm. but I just wanted to, to re- relay those because other people might be experiencing their own little omens. And it's good for, I think it's good astrological data to, to just no, notate it so that you can go back and look at it. Or just have a, a good little short story to tell your friends because they, you know, those are those are always interesting to hear anyway. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, same, similarly, uh, you know, I've had a lot of interesting animal stuff go on, and um, not last night, but night before last, we had a raccoon sit mm-hmm. where my cat sit and like try to like scratch the window like it was a cat like it was oh, it's wow. like do you get in houses often why are you trying to get in my house Maybe. you know but I thought of the the raccoon when you were talking about um the eagle and what mm. you know if you have you know even animal things that happen note it down look up the esoteric or you know abstract meaning of that mm-hmm. animal dream yeah. meaning note down the time you're right it's a really good um and the moon's in scorpio right now after we talked about right. you know all the scorpio stuff we recorded this today thursday march 28th we started it at 10 30 central 11 30 eastern after and the enclosure after it left the enclosure by the way <laughs> that's right that's right and right now it's exactly opposite jupiter so yeah. there is that going on it's at 16 degrees so yes after <laughs> yeah and not on purpose. Um, it was just like good timing, I guess. <laughs> it was exactly. It's like what we tuned into exactly when we need to, uh, yeah, yeah. to record it. That often happens. So note mm-hmm. down those moments like, um, practical astros or Krista was saying, I like yeah. <laughs> speaking of names, um, how do you get in touch with you? Um, on the internet, you can find me at practicalastros.com or on Twitter or Instagram or even Facebook. And, um, yeah, I do natal readings and tarot readings, and I, I've been really loving doing solar return readings. It's kind of my new favorite thing. Um, I did want to show off my tea mug for April. If you can read it. Yes. It feels like <laughs> Venus and Aries. It's dirty on that side. Sorry. I had golden milk and it kind of spilled everywhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for um, doing another forecast episode. These are always so much fun. These are fun. And uh, yeah, I'm Mandy Ray, ecstatic astrology, uh, ecstatic astrology.com. I do similarly natal. Um, I do like secondary progressions a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just use a bunch of techniques when I do my stuff. So, you know, it's a conglomeration. Um, and I really love doing forecasts with you. It's it's enjoyable for me mm-hmm. a lot more so than just talking at the camera. So uh, we'll put this up on YouTube and shout out each other so you can connect with both. Uh, and thank you guys for tuning in if you did. I hope this eclipse season is good to you. Yes. Yes. Yeah.